is time to get started. Got several practice problems from chapter seven. There you go. Let's try the first one. This one is definitely a very typical problem. Uh, we're going to use that equation I told you about that has Rydberg constant in it. <coughs> So because we have a change in uh, energy levels going from the fourth to the third energy level. So let me write down the equation. It's unfortunate that this is not working though up there. Good. 
All right, now how do we find the type of electromagnetic radiation given off? Given off? Well, uh, you would either, if you're doing homework, have to look something like this up in the book. Or if it was an exam, I'd have to give you this information. Okay? So, uh, what we're going to do, we'll look at wavelength. That's what we just calculated. That's what's going to help us find the type of electromagnetic radiation. And it's 1.875 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. Okay, on this spectrum, what kind of light do you think that is? 1.875 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. It's slightly larger than 10 to the minus 6, so it's going to be to the right of this 10 to the minus 6 line. It's definitely in the infrared region. Okay? Definitely in the infrared region, it's slightly to the right of this little tick mark right there. So we are in the IR region, or infrared region. That's the type of light that's given off. This one happens to not be visible. That's okay. Okay. Screen came back on. Okay. Uh, any questions on this problem? It's not an unusual problem where we have two different uh, orbits and have you calculate what kind of region we're in. Let me say one more thing about this. So there's only one small thing that you'll need to remember from this. Uh, besides how to use this, uh, I want you to know the boundaries of the visible spectrum. So what you should know is that on, in this picture on the left side, the violet side caps out at about 400 nanometers. So you should know that approximately 400 nanometers is violet. If you don't know that, make sure you write that down. On the other side of the spectrum, you should know that for the around 700 nanometers is the red side of the visible spectrum. So you should know around 700 is red, around 400 is violet. So you know both uh, caps or both endpoints of the visible spectrum. Okay? Otherwise, there's no other numbers that you'll need to remember here. Cool. So make sure you know those two, 400 and 700. All right, if there's no questions, we'll move on to the next uh, problem that I had up there. That was this one. Let's give this one a try. Here, you see words like accuracy, you see uncertainty, you see velocity, you see a, a length or a radius. This is definitely the uncertainty principle or the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. There's no other uh, formula that would encompass all these. And the key words again would be words like uncertainty, accuracy, precision. You see those words, it's probably this kind of problem. All right, now let's write down first the precise formula is this. Change in x times change in momentum is greater than or equal to h over 4 pi. Uh, now, let me rewrite this in what's going to be a more usable way. First, I know that uh, momentum, P, is mass times velocity. And uh, these deltas here are representing the uncertainty in position times the uncertainty in the momentum. Okay, that's all the delta represents. So, I'm going to rewrite this just as an x, which is a length or a distance, times I'm going to plug in at mass times velocity. And what you're going to see is characteristic of all these. We're going to always give you some percent, say, accuracy in the question. Okay, you'll change to a fraction, but it's going to be a multiplier uh, to sort of be able to calculate the unknown of whether the position or the velocity. And just for simplicity's sake, we'll make this equals to 4, uh, 8 over 4 pi. So then this turns out, all you need to do is find the variables and plug them in. Uh, in this case, we want the uncertainty in the velocity. Let me solve for velocity. Velocity is going to be h over 4 pi x m and then some percent. Well, let's see how to do this. That would be 
a, uh, h is going to be a constant. We'll give that to you on the exam. 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 uh, joule seconds. Okay. Then on the bottom, 4 and pi, those are just numbers. x, the distance, uh, in this case, that's the radius. Okay. So the length given, in this case, is the radius. It's 0 0.05. 0 0.05, and I want to change this from meters to nano, or from nanometers to meters, so times 10 to the nine, minus 9 meters. Okay, so that's the 0.05 nanometers going into meters. The mass here, the mass is going to be a mass of electron. If it's not clearly stated, uh, it's always the mass of electron, which would have to be given. That's 9.109 times 10 to the minus 31st kilograms. Okay? So for a hydrogen atom, that would have one electron, and that's what we're trying to determine, even though it's not explicitly stated in the question. And then uh, the percentage uh, is 1%, and I'm going to change that to a fraction, 0.01. Okay, so I'm changing the percentage to a fraction. Again, the mass uh, and H, mass of electron and H would have to be given on the exam. Or you have to look it up if you're doing the homework. And this turns out to be one, point, uh, one time, there's only one sig fig here, because several of these have one significant figure, one times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Okay, let me tell you what that means. That is the uncertainty in the velocity. Why is that? Because we know the position pretty well. Within 1% of the length of the radius, we know where the electron is. So if we know the position well, we're not going to know the velocity well. So uh, the larger the number, the more we don't know it. Okay, the more the unknown. So if uh, we're talking about really small things, subatomic particles, uh, we'll usually get a relatively larger number for, uh, for an answer because we're going to know what? Well, in this case, the position we knew very well, but we're not going to know the velocity well. And the larger the number, uh, relatively, the more it's unknown. Okay, so we got a large number for that reason. Uh, I don't remember if I put this up last time, but I've gotten certainty principle one and two if you want to see two examples online. All right, but I did bring a second one. This one's for Superman. So let's do the second example. This is also an uncertainty principle question, but now instead of talking about something really tiny, we're going to talk about something really big. Okay, Superman. In this case. Do this problem for Superman. Uh, we're going to solve it in the same way, though. There we go. In this case, I also know it's an uncertainty principle kind of question. I see the words like precision and I see the word uncertainty. That tips me off, at least as verbal cues. And I also see the correct variables. So, in this case, speed is known and position uh, uh, wants to be calculated. Okay, so we want to know position. We're working either with one of those two variables. Either position is known and we want to calculate velocity or vice versa. So, again, if I write the equation kind of how we're going to use it, uh, x is going to equal to h over 4 pi mu times a percent. Just like the last one, this one, time we're solving for x. Let me write it down here. h is going to be 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. Again, a given on the exam and in the textbook. 4 pi. The mass. Now we have Superman's really fat. He is 91 kilograms. We're having a huge, relatively huge mass right there. Okay. Velocity. One-fifth the speed of light. I can write this kind of on scratch over here. It's going to be, the velocity is going to be one-fifth 
times c, the speed of light. So we need to plug in 1 fifth c, or right here, 1 fifth times c, that's 2.9979 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Okay? And then all we have left is the percentage, or uh, the precision in this case is 1.5%, which I'll change to a fraction, 0.15. Okay, let's see what we get for the uncertainty in the position. Now, Superman's really big. He's macroscopic. So we're expecting a very large or a very small number. <laughs> Relatively a pretty small number because for macroscopic large objects, we both will know the speed pretty well and we'll know the position pretty well. The smaller it gets, uh, we'll know one but not the other. So we're expecting a small number here and we definitely get one. Uh, it's 6.4 times 10 to the minus 43. Okay? That means the smaller the number, the better we know it. Okay? So we know his position very well, is what this is saying. Okay. Uh, do you want me to say anything about the units? Who would like help on the units with this one? You raise your hand if not. Okay, I think I got enough hands there. Uh, let me do a little bit on the units. Okay, with the units, let's check this out. In the, and I'll do this on the right hand side of the equation, we had h, which is joule seconds. Okay, h was joule seconds. Uh, we had 4 and pi don't have units. The mass is kilograms. Okay, it's an SI unit. This is SI units only is my recommendation. And then the velocity or the speed of light was meters per second. The percentage doesn't have units. So let's simplify this a little bit. A joule is a newton meter times a second. And then if that's over a kilogram meter per second. Okay. Uh, and then there's a number of ways you can attempt to simplify this. Uh, if you want. Let's write out what a newton is though. A newton is a kilogram meter per second squared, still times that other meter, still times that second, divided by a kilogram meters per second. Okay, so I wrote out the joule, then I wrote out the newton. Now let's see what cancels here. Uh, it looks like we'll get a meter to cancel. It looks like we'll get a kilogram to cancel. And it looks like we'll get the seconds to cancel. Oh, hey, all that's left is a meter. Everything just dropped out. We're left with a meter, which is why I wrote a meter right here. Okay, everything totally drops out. And you should get a meter for x, which is a distance or a position. Any questions on that? All right, those were my three examples. Dun, dun, dun. Let's see where we are as far as schedule goes. We're in the middle of chapter seven. Okay. Uh, exam two is in a couple weeks. By the way, I posted that survey uh, for the extra credit. If you want to take a look at that, it's already posted. Is there a question? Yeah. How did I cancel the uh, seconds? Is the question. Well, for the seconds, I had a one over second squared, right? Times a second that one. And on the bottom, I had a one over second. That one over second flips up, so we've got a one over second squared times a second, times a second. Is that okay? Yeah, good question. All right. Uh, the uncertainty principle, just to say a little bit more about it, helps us answer the question of, I don't know if you've ever wondered, maybe not, why does, for example, a proton stay in the nucleus, but electrons don't? Electrons stay outside of the nucleus. You know what I mean? They, Supposedly, as far as we understand right now in the chapter, they swirl around the nucleus. So, 
we'll have a picture like this, where here's the nucleus, here's the orbits, according to the Bohr model, and we've got electrons out here and protons in the middle. Well, uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle does help us explain this a little bit. What it turns out being, the proton you have to put into a tiny space, that is the nucleus. The electron gets a much bigger space, okay? So, as you decrease the position or the space, the volume, you must increase the momentum. The momentum is directly related to energy. So to force something into a smaller space, like a proton in a nucleus, you need a high amount of energy to do that. Okay? To keep something in a bigger space, like the whole uh, uh, boundary proper or the system of the atom itself, it, within the orbits, it takes less energy because it's bigger volume. So uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle tells us as we decrease the the position, we increase the momentum or the energy required. So it turns out if you do a relatively simple calculation, uh, it's easier to keep the proton is just the right size to be able to stay in the nucleus, and the energy needed, the nuclear binding force, keeps it in there. It's just the right energy to keep something the size of the proton in there. The electron, however, because of its mass and characteristics, it would take too much energy to put an electron in the nucleus, and so it stays on the outside. <coughs> so uh, that's all explained by this uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, or at least demonstrated. All right, so we're finishing this first section of the chapter. Let me show you this first. This is page 55 of the reader here, on the bottom. Okay, we uh, did some of the equations here. We did all these equations, which I'll summarize in just a second. We did some of the terms, and we've compared classical and quantum mechanics. So these are the five concepts that I'm going to summarize in just a second that we have finished now. So after I summarize these two boxes, we're going to move on to this section here in the lower right. Okay, so that's where we're at in the chapter. Uh, and I'm going to show you a table here. Now, unfortunately, your book doesn't summarize, but I, this table, I think, is posted online, and it's also on page 63 of the reader. Okay. Here, uh, in the third column, it's all five concepts we just explained. These concepts were picked just to illustrate why quantum mechanics could make sense. Okay? And you need to know these. All of these know them conceptually, and a couple of them we have to know math with. So for the first one, atomic line spectra, classically, we thought that all wavelengths were possible, carried within light, but we found out, according to atomic line spectra, uh, examples, that each element has its unique spectrum, unique light. Okay? And that has an equation, we're going to use the Rydberg, so that does have math involved with it. The next one, black body radiation won't. But we thought that as wavelength decreases, intensity will increase indefinitely. But we found out that's not true. Uh, that there is a maximum and then it decreases, actually. So it has that discontinuous nature. There's also photoelectric effect. That won't have any math with regards to our class. But that uh, we thought that energy, as the energy and intensity of light increase, then the number of electrons removed could increase. However, we found, according to quantum mechanics and modern science, that it only occurs above a certain threshold energy. So that's that concept. Then there's wave particle duality, where we used to think something either a particle or a wave, but not both. But we found out that's absolutely not the case. It can be both. And that's that associated with it with the probability equation. And then finally, what we just did, the uncertainty principle, where classically we can know the position and the velocity. However, uh, uh, according to quantum mechanics, we can know one or the other after leaving but not both. Okay? And that has math. That's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle equation. Is there a question? Okay. So those are, that's what we just did in the last lecture. And let's take a look at all the equations we've seen so far. Okay? So that's summarized as well. Here's all the equations you should have seen so far in the class. 
S equals lambda nu. Be the light is lambda times frequency. Uh, energy is h nu times constant times frequency, and if we can plug them two together, energy is h c over lambda. Then we're uh, working with what, just for simplification, I'm calling the Rydberg equation. Delta e is the Rydberg constant times the change in square inverse squares of the orbits. And that's also equal to hc over lambda because that's energy. Just remember to take the absolute value of the energy. We have the Broglie equation. That's this one right here. This is if you need to convert between uh, something particulate to something with a wavelength. And then we have the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. All of these equations will be given uh, on the exam as described in the practice exam reader. Uh, you just need to know how to use them. These are all, I recommend always using the SI units with all these equations. I think it will simplify your life. So SI units for chapter 7. All right, we're ready to move on. Uh, I brought my jump rope because you know we like to exercise. Uh, somebody want to help me out? You're okay you can do this? I think so. Okay, hold this, man. What's your name? Yeah, I already knew that. Okay. <laughs> Where are you from? Uh, Yuba City. Yuba City. Yeah. Hey, so if I was touring California and I went to Yuba City, why would I go there? Uh, there's no reason. There's no reason. <laughs> <laughs> All right, put that down. We're going over. Uh, uh, let's go over here. Okay, you stand over there by the door. All right. I want you to stand closer. Okay. So. Uh, we're gonna, well, you know about jump ropes, right, man? You oh, can yeah. handle this? Yeah. If you mess up, you vote it off, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, here, what kind of wave is this, anybody? There's two types of waves. This is a standing wave. The other kind of wave is what? But this might take a while. Okay, it's called a traveling wave. One that moves like ocean waves, for example. Okay? This is a standing wave like a string on an instrument. It does not move. Okay? Uh, it's confined to a certain location. All right. This wave has how many nodes? Okay. So there's two ways to think of nodes. There's two externally where our hands are. That's where it crosses the center. But we're going to focus more on internal nodes. That is, any nodes between our hands. How many nodes does this have? Should say zero, not including where our hands are. Does that make sense? Okay. What is the uh, if the distance between us is L, say the variable L, what's the wavelength? How many wavelengths do you see right now? You should see half a wavelength right now. Does that make sense? It's not the whole wave. It hasn't repeated yet, it's not a full cycle. Is that okay? Okay, so you're not seeing a full wave. This is half a wave. So L equals lambda over 2 at this point. Okay, wavelength over 2. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, let's speed it up and let's see if this makes sense. Okay, you ready? Now hold up. Okay, you ready? Just chill. Just do your thing. You're okay? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Uh, don't mess around right now. Okay, all right. Now how many wavelengths are you seeing? One, so lambda, the wavelength equals L. Is that okay? How many nodes are you seeing? One. And this is a higher or lower energy right now? It's higher. I'm so strong I could hardly feel it, but you can see how hard he's working. <laughs> All right, now hold up. You're going to stay right there. Okay? Don't mess around. Don't approach me either. People close to me. I'm big bubble. All right. You just saw that. That one was the first one. And this one's the second one. See what we're doing? All right. Are you ready? Yeah. You're really ready. Okay. Here we go. We're going to try again. Now let's go up another energy level. Okay. There we go. How many nodes do you see? You should see two. What's the wavelength? You should see one and a half. So lambda equals three halves 
our uh, L equals 3 halves lambda right now. Does that make sense? Do you see how we're going? And we're at a higher energy. Okay, this happens in chemistry too. Thanks. Yeah. Good job. Right? Even though you're from Yuba City, I'm from And if you want, you probably don't need it because you're already getting an A plus, but if you want extra credit, just let me know. All right. By email. Okay, cool. That was this one. That last one was this one right here. Okay? We could, if, if he was stronger, we could have gone higher energy. Okay. So, uh, but we got to this point right here, but you can imagine you can go further, uh, further and further. This is section six, which is page uh, 64 in the reader at page 266 in the textbook, and you'll see a picture like this in both the reader and the textbook. This one specifically from the text. Yeah. Okay, so she's asking, uh, how do you figure out the nodes with respect to the x-axis, basically? Here's the x-axis in between the connecting points between where our hands were. So it's zero here. We're, we're only counting internal nodes. It's going to be just this one here, going through the center point, and then two here. The next one would be three, and then four. It follows a pattern, zero, one, two, three, etc. Okay? Uh, and then see how the uh, L follows a pattern. L is the distance between us. Lambda over two, two lambda over two, three lambda over two. The next one would be four lambda over two, etc. So everything's following a pattern right now. And this again is for a standing wave where there's no displacement, like a guitar string or something like that. These would be higher harmonics. So if you pluck your string and then you tap it right there, you're making a higher harmonic. Or you pluck your string, you tap it right there at the third, then you're making another harmonic. Okay. So let me kind of write this out in a different way for us, just so I can kind of summarize what's going on right now. So, uh, this is section six, this is wave mechanics, wave mechanics. <coughs> Remember electrons and things like that can be described as waves. So, uh, we have this, like if we have like, uh, kind of position one, two, three, uh, dot, 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 then uh, for the first one, the number of nodes we had is zero the first one we did. And then it'll be one, and then it'll be two, etc. Okay? This will go uh, dot, 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 etc. Okay? <laughs> then, uh, let's talk about the wavelength. So, uh, and in terms of L, so L, and usually we capitalize, I'm going to capitalize L here. L, capital L, this was lambda over 2. Uh, the next one, L is equal to 2 lambda over 2. And the next one, L is equal to 3 lambda over 2. Dot, 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 etc. So 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. Alright, before I go on, this, remember we talked about, what's N, by the way? Remember N from before? What was that? Is it integer and? It's a counting number, it's also the orbit number. And it's also this. That's it. Same end that we've been talking about so far. These are kind of like orbits. Again, you're not going to know exactly what it is until maybe the end of the lecture today. So this goes up to a total of n. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to n. Uh, so the number of nodes is what in terms of n? n minus 1 is the number of nodes. And then L equals n lambda over 2, or if you want to write it the other way, you can write it in terms of lambda equals 2L over n. Okay? So you want to know these two formulas. Nodes equals n minus 1, and however you want to write the second formula, lambda is 2L over n. Going to use those. Okay. Now, because you saw between us when we're 
flipping the jump rope. Uh, it has this curvature looking like a sine or a cosine function. Is that okay? So it's a function. Okay. In math, you're probably talking about functions. You can call them like f of x equals 3x plus 2 or whatever. Does that make sense? Or g of x or whatever you call them in math. Okay, we do that same thing, but we don't like English Roman letters. So we're going to use a different letter called psi. Okay, psi is a function, so we'll call the first one psi 1 of x, the second one psi 2 of x, the third one psi 3 of x, all the way up to psi n of x. Okay? So, just psi instead of f of x, we're calling it psi. That's it. Okay? Kind of feels more wave-like, so we use that one. Okay. Now, that psi, you can tell it would be a function like a sine or a cosine function. We model it uh, in this section as a sine function. Okay? So it's actually a sine function. Uh, and you wouldn't have to derive this, though you could if you wanted to. Uh, the function itself would be, and I'll put this in a different color, 2 over L, the square root of 2 over L sine, for the first one, pi x over L. Okay? For the, let's, let me write the third one. That's the first one. The third one, for example, is 2L sine 3 pi x over L. N would be 2 over L sine n pi x over L. I'll zoom in a little bit so it's easier to see. So this last one is the formula. Formula. Right here, for the wave function that Deep and I were creating. Okay? We won't really have to use this formula, but I am illustrating it to you and you'll see it in the textbook. Okay? Schrodinger uh, is one of the persons who basically said electrons, and this is modeling an electron, electrons exhibit wave like properties that can be modeled mathematically. And they're modeled through a function we call a wave function. So that's one word, a wave function. And that's a mathematical model or function of a wave. So remember, an electron or any particle can act as a wave or a particle. And so we're imagining, we're putting an electron in a box, and it's acting like a wave depending on what its energy is. So the smaller n is, the lower the energy. As n increases, the higher the energy. Okay? So as n increases, the energy will go up. Uh, kind of like this diagram right here. This is from your textbook. As n increases on the y-axis for each of these sides, uh, the, ener the energy is increasing as well. So n and energy go parallel. Okay, this out of the way now. So we call this um, usually either two two different things. Either we call this a particle in a box or a two-dimensional wave function. A okay, particle in a box or a two-dimensional wave function. That's when we're, we're kind of uh, putting the electron in a flat cage, uh, that in a box, literally, that has no depth, and we're seeing how it behaves. Now, realistically, uh, there are three dimensions. But the reason that the textbook and other uh, classes do this first is it's easier to understand two-dimensional before we go to the three dimensions. So just imagine this is a stepping stone so we can get to the three dimension in the next section. Okay? So just a, a slightly easier to imagine. So for example, and I won't have you draw one of these, 
but I'll show you uh, kind of what it looks like and I'll tell you what you'll need to know about this. Let's say I wanted to know what psi 3 is, psi 3 of x. So I wanted to know what that was. Then uh, all I would do, I could plot it. Psi of x versus x, and x goes from 0 to L. That's the length of our box. We've got the y-axis on the left, the x-axis here, and one more fancy axis here makes it look like a box. Okay? Doesn't really need to be there, it just looks more box-like. Okay? Psi 3 of x, what's n? Yes, that number right there, 3. How many nodes do I have? Yeah, n minus 1 or 2. What's L equal to? <coughs> 3 lambda over 2. Or lambda is 2 L over 3. Either way. Okay, so that means I have a node, two nodes here, equally spaced, and it would look something like this. We already we have already drawn that one out before. Just previously we saw that one drawn out. That's what it would look like. To make it a little darker so it's easier to see. So there's a the cycle three-way function. I wouldn't have you draw this on an exam, but I would ask you the questions I just did. What's n? What's the number of nodes? What's L in terms of lambda? Those sort of questions are fair game. Okay? So you would need to be able to identify nodes, tell me the number of nodes, uh, etc. Alright. Well, uh, I don't want to blow your brains too much, so we'll take a break for a moment.